Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 12th meeting of the Health and Sport Committee in 2017. Can I ask everyone to uh, ensure that the mobile phones are on silent? You can, of course, use your mobile phones for social media, but not to take photographs or film proceedings. Uh, the first uh, item on the agenda is an evidence session on the preventative agenda. Could I welcome to the committee uh, Dr Una McFadgen, uh, consultant paediatrician at Fort Valley Royal Hospital, fellow of the college uh, and a member of the College Council uh, of the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh. Uh, uh, Dr Margaret McCartney, General Practitioner and Dr Hel Helen Irvin, Consultant in Public Health. Uh, we are due to be joined by Amelia Creighton, Head of uh, Health Services, Public Health, NHS, Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Um, we'll move directly to first questions. Uh, Alison. Thank you, Convener, and good morning. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to kick off with a question. I see that there are common themes emerging from the written submissions from, from, from all the witnesses this morning. Um, Dr Irvin, you say in, in your written submission that the current demand we're facing means we need to prioritise and that no area should be exempt from scrutiny or regarded as sacred. Um, and there's you know, discussion of the breast screening programme in your own written submission and in, in that of um, Dr McCartney. So I'd just like to ask, how is evidence which counters current practice discussed in Scotland and why and how are decisions to either continue or discontinue programmes which perhaps aren't cost effective made? How are these decisions made? That's a very good question. I think when it comes to the breast screening programme and um, most of the other major screening programmes, the decisions are really made by a UK-wide screening committee and Scotland implements um, those decisions. Um, one of the uh, observations I made during a bigger piece of work on um, routinely collected data in Scotland and um, my concerns about how we we're adopting policies from England highlighted the same issue that I, I fear that sometimes we implement policies that are decided south of the border and I suspect that when it comes to the breast screening program we don't review all the evidence in Scotland and then decide what we're going to do. I suspect that we follow the UK screening committee. Is, is that your view too? Yes, I, I think so. So the UK National Screening Committee is a very good organisation, but the um, franchise I almost um, parts of looking at evidence remits, for example, um, there is an advisory committee on breast cancer screening. But what I'm really concerned about is that there hasn't been a good cost effectiveness analysis for some time, particularly including opportunity costing. So the amount of time that we spend doing that when we could be doing something else of more value. And the other big issue is how good we are at sharing um, decision making around breast cancer screening and actually all forms of cancer screening in Scotland as well because that is devolved so um, I, I don't think that we do it well enough I don't think we do it thoroughly enough and I don't think we do it um, with um, with the attitude that actually if something isn't working we should really interrogate the evidence and ask should we stop doing that or not so for example the health check program the keep well program there's now quite a lot of evidence that says that this doesn't work it doesn't improve quality of life or extend life so I would ask why are we spending so much money on it when we know that there are other things that really do work and we could be spending that money on we have this opportunity cost um, this issue which I think is a huge one because if you have a limited amount of GPs and GP time and you're asking them to spend money on stuff that doesn't work that means we're not doing the things that really does work and does make a difference to people's lives and that's a huge issue and one that I think has been sort of sailing under the current and not properly interrogated really for decades now. Okay, I mean it's obviously a politically difficult decision if this, if this were to stop and I see it has been questioned in other countries, and I note the, the, the evidence you've given about Switzerland, and the, there's a view that it just sort of got past the last UK review, the, the Sir Michael Marmot review. I mean, do you think if we were to look at this more discreetly, uh, with that Scottish focus, we might come to a different decision? I don't see that looking at it from a Scottish perspective should be any different from looking at it for, uh, from an English perspective. It should It should be looked at and anyone who looked at it objectively would conclude that it wasn't a good idea to do it at a universal level. So screening should be considered for targeted screening at high-risk women where the return for the effort and the risks incurred will be lower 
therefore the cost-benefit ratio better. And I don't think that, that um, there's going to th be anything different about a Scottish analysis other than the, f the, d the f stats will be about 11% in terms of the actual volume. So uh, the beauty of looking at the UK-wide approach is that you're looking at a bigger sample size. Um, and if we did it at a Scottish level, we'd be looking at a much smaller number of women screened, a much smaller number of women's lives saved, and so on. But I think it should be looked at UK-wide. It, it would be odd if Scotland went ahead unilaterally and tried to scrap it, um, you know, and leaving England to carry on with the programme. So it's one of those very sensitive issues that I think would be tr awkward to try and go it alone. And th there's certainly some evidence in the submission about how the, the, the programme originated in the first place yes. um, with, with Margaret Thatcher's government. Can I just add something about that point? In 1989, I did the MPH at number one Lilybank in Glasgow, the professor Jim McEwen, and we studied all those reports in detail, and many of us in the MSC program, MPH program, Master of Public Health, had major concerns about the screening program even in 1989. And in fact, that same year, um, Maureen Roberts, a breast physician from Edinburgh who had spent 10 years um, looking at this subject and had advocated going ahead with a screening program, uh, wrote in the BMJ that she suspected it had been an error of judgment, and she wrote that posthumously. And, if you, and I have these papers with me. If you read that material from Maureen Roberts, it makes really compelling reading from, from the dead. The fact that this woman who devoted her career to breast screening and breast pathology um, dies from the disease and then writes in those last months before she dies that it's been a mistake to actually advocate a national screening program and she cites all the criticisms of the program and that was 1989, just one year after the decision was made by the uh, Tory government of the day to go ahead possibly because it would be a vote winner for women. So it does worry me that um, there was a political dimension and then one of the um, Scottish experts expressed his concern about it um, in those months before she dies from the disease. Um, you spoke about a sort of more targeted approach and, and making sure that we were, you know, seeing high-risk women. Now, we, we can tell sort of from health inequalities and, you know, concerns are raised about the worried well and, and the amount of resources used inequitably. I'd like to understand how we go about making sure we reach those women, but also you say it in your... Um, written submission that uh, a strategy is doomed to fail if it doesn't have GPs at the heart of any new model. I mean, I suppose GPs are absolutely essential. We, we've heard from GPs at the deep end, you know, their concerns about the inequity in funding. Could you expand on that, please? I'm going to answer your second question first. Um, I've done a major piece of work on uh, the funding of the various components of the NHS, the amount of money we're spending on hospital consultants, GPs, district nurses, social care of the elderly, and so on. And I have major concerns about the disinvestment in general practice. I actually believe at the moment the entire NHS is at risk because of the progressive disinvestment since 2006, which is ongoing. Um, I just don't see how we can really expect GPs to pick up early cancer in patients who already have the disease and how they can promote health and um, discourage patients from smoking and drinking too much and so on. All the things that we know would have a high return on investment because we know people are more likely to listen to these messages from their GP than anyone else. So the idea that we spend vast sums of money on something like breast screening that exposes all the women aged 50 to 70 to radiation every three years generates a huge false positive rate, has a very high screening to life saved ratio, and yet we disinvest progressively in the GPs, seems to me a bizarre approach. And, and the breast screening program is just one of many um, programs, uh, public health programs. You may think at all that a public health doctor would question um, some of the initiatives, but I think we need to review all the public health initiatives and see what we're actually getting for the money and what potential harm we're creating and also if we're contributing to the inequality um, in health issue, which I, I believe we are. The first part of your question, I'm not an expert on breast screening and, and, and which, how you would go about targeting, but it would probably be around genetic markers. So you would identify the women that have family history and are positive for breast cancer markers and you would focus on those women and you would get a better return on this on any kind of routine screening. Okay, thank you. 
Ivan. Yeah. Thanks, convener. Thanks, panel, for coming along. Um, <clears throat> first comment I wanted to make was, um, I suppose my wee bit concerned, just looking at this from from a wider picture, that we jump, we talk about prevention, but we immediately jump straight in and start talking about screening, as if screening equals prevention, prevention equals screening. Um, to my mind, it's clearly much wider than that. I think you make the point, Dr. Irvin, that it is much wider than that, but then you also say that um, prevent in public health terms, people talk about preventative med medicine as if it doesn't include what I would consider the main part of that, which is what GPs do, et cetera, et cetera, the upstream stuff. So I'm a bit concerned about the terminology here, um, and I think we need to refocus back on the wider concept of prevention, i.e. doing stuff earlier to stop stuff happening, happening later. Um, and I really want to focus down on the the cost side of that and any data we've got on that and the, um, the, the effectiveness and the mechanisms for judging interventions. Um, now, you use words like huge, substantial, considerable costs. When you're talking about it, you've put some data in there, and a, a quick look at that, you're talking about 250 million spent, which sounds a big number, but obviously it's less than 2% of total health service spend in Scotland, so in the big scheme of things, it's not a big number. Um, so I want to explore that a wee bit further, um, and also bearing in mind what Christy talked about in terms of 40% of public sector spend was potentially preventable by doing stuff upstream. Um, I want to explore that a bit more. Um, and I suppose the real nub of what I'm trying to get to is what mechanisms are there that allow us to do data crunching to be able to, from a financial point of view, say doing this works, be that screening, be that investment in GPs, be that investment in primary versus secondary, be that whatever it is, what tools and mechanisms are there that allow us to actually make proper, quantified, evidence, data-driven decisions on preventative spend in the wider sense? Are you asking me? I'm asking anybody who wants to answer. Does anyone want to have a go at that? Do you want me to? Well, the whole thing, so, so in terms of what the submission that I submit, sort of put into yourselves, which areas of preventative spending would it be useful for the Health and Sports Committee to investigate? I'm really interested in putting resources where they work. I think if we don't have evidence-based policy making, we're absolutely sunk in the NHS. And I'm really worried that we're throwing good money after bad again and again and again. And you might say it's only 2%, it's only 3%. Actually, these small numbers really add up and they make a big difference when you're talking about the general practice service, for example, you can give the amount of district nurses that we have. How can we do more work in the community when we simply do not have the hands on staff able to do that. If you don't have the district nurses, you can't allow people a good death at home because they can't physically you know, um, multiply themselves in order to do that work. Our health visitors have been um, are now working horizontally across practices. We're really risking that the primary care team that we know has had huge um, benefits in terms of vaccinations and so forth because women and families have long-term relationships with staff that they know and trust and are part of their team. So in terms of you know, where is the data, there's lots of data, but there's lots of data to tell us that that we're doing stuff right now that does not work and is wasting money and is causing harm. So with breast cancer screening, for example, the big issue is overdiagnosis. And it sounds so attractive, early diagnosis. You know, have a health check, pick up on something early, we can make a difference to you. It does, it sounds so attractive. It's a political vote winner. Lots of politicians from many parties over many generations and lots of areas of the world have used this. But the problem is you don't get the full information about it in a sound bite. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, again, you're saying things, we need to be data-driven, then you're saying things that aren't data-driven. Can you, in terms of where you would spend the money, and that's what I'm trying to get to, is you're saying we should spend it on nothing or whatever, what data do you have to say that that works from a preventive spend point of view, and what mechanisms are in place to analytically understand where we should spend the money? So what you're saying is, do you, are you asking for randomised controlled trials or systematic reviews of where you put money? Term, in terms so in of terms spend. of housing, there's good Cochrane reviews to say that um, people living in high quality housing that's not damp and cold have fewer asthma exacerbations, for example. The, terms. I'd need to go back and look at the Cochrane review. Right. So you can Google it. So if you okay. Google Cochrane review, I think it was New Zealand studies, but I'm primarily also some in you England. About, yeah, what I'm trying to get to is, a lot of people say, we should do this, we should do that, we should do the other, we shouldn't do that because because of this. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to get to is what data-driven analysis is there. If we spend X hundred million on nurses, we will save X billion on something else. So, so 
what you probably want to Where's do that is, is a health economist to answer those questions. Mm -hmm. And if you wanted that kind of answer, it would have been really useful to have those questions framed like that, okay. so that I would have spent more time okay. in doing what you wanted, which was giving you the data you were looking for, okay. which is completely possible to do. Can I try sure, and answer now? Sure, of course, now? please. Um, you, you didn't think that the sums of money that we're currently spending are that big because as a percentage they're not that large. I actually think we are spending a lot of money if it's not giving us the sufficient return on the investment. And the evidence for that is the rising index of inequality. The fact that the gap between the rich and poor in terms of life expectancy is increasing every single year and it's the, the mortality rates are falling for both rich and poor, but the gap is getting wider every year. That's one obvious um, f failing of our current strategy, that we're spending that 250 million pounds and we're leaving the poor behind. That's one obvious. The, uh, the, the most cost-effective way to improve public health is to reduce the gap in income and wealth and opportunity between the rich and the poor. And most of you, I'm sure, will have um, read The Spirit Level and the subsequent um, book by um, Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett. And I don't want to seem simplistic, but that really is the essence of public health. You would improve um, hundreds of uh, parameters if you reduce the gap deliberately, and you have to focus on that. Once you start leaving the focus on that gap and you start introducing a myriad of other approaches, um, you get distracted and you create a lot of false positives, which means the hospital uh, is focused on dealing with all the breast lumps that you've identified and all the um, false positives within that cohort, and you lose sight of what you really need to do is you ensure that the gap is minimized. It, Back again. If you took that to, I'm supposing we did nothing that was on that list pandemic, flu, health screening, tobacco control, alcohol issues, health protection, the whole lot, bin, all of that, to that £250 million, what would you spend it on and what difference would it make? Well, I wouldn't just um, cancel a lot of that. I would right, also exactly. look at the huge wastage that some spent um, responding to unnecessary admission to hospital. Because we've starved general practice, district nursing, social care of the elderly, we have a much higher emergency admission rate than we should. So we're then having to pour money into no, more A&E physicians, more acute physicians, uh, and more staff for the hospital. And we don't see it, and it's obvious. All you have to do is plot the data, plot the emergency admissions, plot the compliance failures in the A&E, and you'll see that they coincide with clusters of very, very old patients. And the reason the old patients are pouring into the A&E is not because of demographics, it's because we've cut back on the GP, the district nurse, and the social care of the elderly. And that is data-driven. I can absolutely demonstrate that. that. Right. Well, so how you, much have we spent I didn't, I didn't show you that data G. because you were asking me about preventative spend, and I p chose the breast screening program as an example amongst others that we need to review to see if we can liberate some funds. But the big money that's being spent is obviously in the hospitals. And you could sh shed a lot of that money if you reduce the demand for it by a strong community-based service, so which stop, you don't have. There's two, two parts to that. One is you're talking about screening. If we stop screening, how much money would that save? Well, whatever is spent on the screening, depending on the different programs. Right. And I'm not suggesting that we cancel all the screening programs. So I'm, suggesting, I'm suggesting that we review each and every one of them to see what we're getting for the money, the cost effectiveness of it. And then if it doesn't uh, stack up, we then consider so toning any, it down. You don't have any numbers on how much that would No, say. if you look right, at my okay. submission, I said we needed to review them. Right, and I think okay. that's a fair... So you're taking a view on that without the data? Well, yes, I am. I, I looked at the Marmot inquiry, and it told me that in the whole of the UK, they estimated that 1,300 lives would be saved from breast cancer, and that um, between three, uh, and, and according to other studies, up to 13 women would have an unnecessary mastectomy or lumpectomy with or without adjuvant treatment. And up to, um, well, they stated 200, but up to 1,000 women would need to be screened to save that life. Depending on the studies you look at, I think those numbers need to be examined. I don't think that's good enough, and I don't think that's a public health approach. So I think that's an interventionist approach. Preventative spend, you don't have any data on how much the screening program would save if we didn't, okay, if we didn't do it. Can I count to this? Um, so, yeah. so part of the problem is finding out what things actually cost. So for example, if you look at the health screening, um, so which I've 
published on this recently, and we found wildly um, different answers from different health boards giving different figures. Part of the problem is it's, it's so fragmented, the costs are not fully inclusive. So, for example, opportunity cost is hardly ever examined. Pharmacy time and patient time, patient burden in particular. So, th actually, gathering data on this would be a PhD thesis within mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. It is almost impossible to find, and that is one of the problems. And just to emphasize again, opportunity cost is almost never examined. So, it's you can sort of say what the cost is of the drugs. You can say what the cost is of supplying a certain staff for certain amounts of times, but the distraction that it causes is a fundamental problem. The other so issue... And therefore that we don't, I mean, there's 160,000 people employed in the health service and spend £13 billion. Pound. They can't find somebody to go and do the number crunching to justify or, or understand where the money's well, getting spent. That looks to me like a problem. It's difficult to get this data. You find academics have published and written in small areas looking at it, and probably most of these people are doing it in their own time, but actually getting coherent numbers across the whole of Scotland is remarkably hard to do. The other problem is cost-effectiveness analysis. They're very rarely done independently of the organisation that are funding it. That's another okay. huge difficulty. Okay. Do, you, do you want to come in on this? In terms of assessing the cost of programmes, the way they have been designed would be embedded into the, the delivery of the NHS. So it wouldn't be difficult to find out exactly how much we spend because as screening coordinator, I know exactly what staff we actually employ to deliver. So it's not impossible to get the data. The other point to make on screening programs, we have a national screening committee, which is a UK committee that is tasked with reviewing evidence. They have actually commissioned the MARMO review and if there are any issues, it's up to the National Screening Committee to go back to the evidence and look at the cost effectiveness. The value of the lives spent, as uh, Helen have identified that the screening saves, can be subject to either the NICE, because we have the value for money in terms of how much it costs to either get a, uh, an out, any outcome, whether it's life save or quality of life. The other point I would like to make is actually if what we have seen, particularly through screening programs, you save people from one disease, but the way humans are designed, we will simply have another one. So if we look at Californians, they have saved uh, coronary uh, care beds by preventative measures for coronary heart disease, and now they have to do joint replacements because the degenerative conditions uh, kick in as we age. So it's up to us to decide what's worth. Certainly extending life and preventing people dying young from <coughs> diseases that are highly preventable. And I would like to point out that having grown up in communist Romania where we were all equal, that hasn't stopped us from smoking and drinking excessively and dying young from preventable diseases. So there's a fine balance we have to find. In terms of the data that you have and the costs, could you provide the committee with that later? We can certainly. I will need to go back and... Yeah. Um, Alex? Could I just um, add yes, a small sorry. point, just yeah. picking up on Ivan's question yeah. about uh, prevention versus screening and just to pick up on positives of what has been shown to be preventive. One of them in relation to breast cancer is breastfeeding. Um, and you'll see from the evidence we gave from the college about early intervention that there is good evidence and good data that breastfeeding does reduce the risk of breast cancer and perhaps sometimes pushing positive messages rather than, if you like, potentially negative messages of um, we'll find you when you have a disease or when you have early signs of a disease. To have true prevention would be to re reduce the person's risks of ever having that disease. And so to emphasise, and there is data from UNICEF and the Baby Friendly Initiatives, to emphasise what could be a preventive measure. Um, which would cost nothing to anyone other than the mum who's providing the milk for the baby. Um, it actually protects that mother against risk of breast, breast cancer. So there are a number of initiatives that could be positive preventive measures that are not specifically related to screening programmes. Another point I'd like to make about data collection is that there is very little uniformity over the ways that data is collected across different health boards. And if you are going to ask a question that covers the country, then I think it would be really important to provide the, to make, ask the right question so that you're starting from the question and not trying to draw answers from data that was provided for a different reason. And then also make the data collection easy to make it part of what's done routinely. So you're not employing people just for data collection. 
and that you provide the IT facilities to make it happen. And I think the differences in IT across different health boards um, interferes with the reliability of some of the data that you might be hoping for. Uh, can I, can I just add that breastfeeding is much more likely in the privileged um, classes, and that's another reason to try and improve the um, economic welfare of the people at the bottom end. It's, in my view, a bit cheeky to try and expect people that are really struggling, that aren't employed, that aren't well-educated, that don't have meaningful employment, to get them to adopt healthy lifestyles and to get them to breastfeed. And anyone who's done it knows that breastfeeding isn't easy. It, it's inconvenient at times. It means that the husband can't just give a bottle because you're trying to fully breastfeed. So having breastfed two children myself and having witnessed my daughter doing it recently, um, it's one of these things that you have to be really committed to, very difficult to combine with a job. And the idea that um, we just get everyone to breastfeed when they're struggling and uh, they have really major financial worries and housing problems, I think is cheeky and unrealistic. Um, Alex. Morning to the panel. I'm very glad that um, uh, Dr. McFadgen made that point and that observation just before uh, the convener brought me in because it felt slightly incongruous to me that as part of our preventative agenda we were looking at screening because screening for me is catching things after they've happened and okay it's an early intervention but I think that's a problem in political circles that we often conflate early intervention and prevention as being the same things but actually you know we need to get to this before it gets out of the traps and um, I guess some screening can pick up uh, DNA profiles which may make people more susceptible to certain conditions um, and yes that can be a preventative side of things um, but my question was specifically in respect of uh, health inequalities and I think Dr Irvin you articulated that very well when you picked up the point about breastfeeding just now in respect of um, those communities which are uh, less likely to breastfeed because of their social deprivation and the, the various factors around them um, in I'd like to sort of explore the uptake of screening opportunities because we don't screen everybody in this country because it's a voluntary thing nobody's mandated to go and get screened so as a result you will have a heavier weight of demographic of the worried well as it were than you will who have uh, for uh, people in populations who are perhaps more at risk of some of these conditions given the other sort of um commensurate lifestyle factors that uh, that they have around them um how do we how do we fix that I mean because it strikes me that actually you know a lot of that time and energy and resource is, a, is actually spent checking people who keep themselves pretty well anyway who probably know how to check themselves for lumps um, and, uh, and and who are fine whereas actually it's the it's that sort of uh, that nucleus of people in deprived communities who aren't necessarily opening their mail who don't see that there's an opportunity to have screening of one kind or another and don't take up that opportunity what you're asking me to do is uh, um, advise on how do we increase uptake of screening programs by those people who have the highest risk. Yeah. And I suppose I would backtrack and say that, first of all, I don't want to promote screening generally unless you have a very sensitive and very specific test. And that brings us to the breast screening program. It isn't good enough, in my opinion. It creates some false negatives and a lot of false positives. And therefore, the idea of spending even more money and more time and effort trying to target the other quarter of the population that has a better return um, isn't the way I would go. I would be looking at emphasizing primary prevention. You hit the nail on the head when you said it's picking up disease that's already there. So it's what we call secondary prevention, and that was outlined in the submission by my health board, GGNC. And by the way, I need to remind everyone that I'm not representing the views of my health board today. I'm here as a consultant in my own right. Um, but So I, I wouldn't be wanting to go down that route. I would be wanting to promote a healthy diet. Now, not, not by telling people repeatedly what to eat and what not to eat, which isn't working, but by public health protective policy, the trans fatty acids in the chip fat. I would even regulate the amount of salt that's allowed to come out of the salt shaker in your chippy. I would regulate the amount of, of salt and sugar and fat that's in all these junk foods. We have far too many different types of junk food to choose from. We have far too many different types of alcohol that are too close to us physically. We can buy it anywhere. Uh, too many long hours on the, on the pub. Remember when we had the licensing laws changed? 
That was one of the most bizarre things that I thought the Scots could do was make it easier to drink at all hours. Um, given the existing problematic relationship between the Scots and alcohol, why would we make it even easier? Um, so I, I, I believe in primary prevention, but I don't believe in relying on health education, which isn't working because we can see the inequality gap getting wider. I believe in reducing the gap uh, proactively using taxation and a whole range of other fiscal policies. The work of Chick Collins, um, the report he wrote about I don't smoke but I, and I don't drink but I'm still unhealthy, in brackets because I'm poor and I'm stressed. Um, that's the way to go and I, I absolutely fervently believe that. I'm not going to change my mind. I've been in public health for 26 years and, and just as a, a final note, when I was sitting in the MPH in 1989, um, and I was five years into the UK, having left Canada, I despaired when I heard what the plans were for Scotland in 1989, which was to hire an army of health improvement officers who have no contact with patients, who produce leaf boxes of leaflets that distribute out to people who don't read them. They sit in the GP's office and they often don't even get used. Um, because I knew that the solution was meaningful employment, not complex benefit systems, but meaningful employment where people can actually live on the wage that they're paid. And that it's as simple as that. You don't need to hire consultants like me. You just reduce the gap and everything will improve. Mental health, physical health, everything will improve. And if you read the spirit level, uh, you, you should be persuaded. And if you haven't read that book, you need to do that. Sorry. Wow, thank you for that. Um, that was very compelling. Um, I think you, it's very, very much grist to the mill of those around this table who would like to see this committee generate an obesity bill um, to take to the Scottish Parliament to tackle some of those actual practical issues you described there. Um, I think, as I say, I think your, your evidence is very compelling and um, I, am, I find myself educated by what you have just said in terms of the, the fact that, that in some cases screening may actually be a false flag. It may be a, a comfort blanket to politicians and to the wider public to say that your decision makers are doing something about this when actually we're not. We're just um, spotting it in a few people and we're not preventing it in anybody. So, um, no, this has been really helpful, so thank you. Um, has bothered me slightly. When I looked at the routinely collected data for our health board, the commonest medical elective diagnosis, i.e. reason for admission, okay, of the, all the medical elective work was breast cancer. Now that may only be 2% of all the medical elective admissions, but we're talking about uh, tens of thousands of, of admissions. The commonest one was medical. Was the medical elective was for breast cancer. Now, that to me is a, f a symptom of our focus in the breast screening program, and also the general obsession with lumps. And unfortunately, breasts are lumpy. So if you become obsessed with trying to prevent every death from breast cancer, you end up treating a lot of lumps that didn't need treated, and then you get what I've just pointed out to you, that it ends up being your commonest medical elective admission. Now, I would submit that it's going to be difficult to measure the actual cost of your breast screening program because you have to c measure the, the cost of the, the lady coming in and being worried about it, having a lumpectomy that she didn't need, taking time off work, and so on, the fact that it's then difficult to feel the breast thereafter because there's a big scar in the breast after where the lump has been taken out. So there's all these costs that are impossible to measure. And that's why overall I would concur with Margaret that um, totally apart from the actual costs financially of the screening program, you have to measure all these other uh, unforeseen costs and the impossible to measure costs. Can I come in? Just, so w one of the things I really worry about with in breast screening is one example, but the health checks programme is another, is exactly what you've said, is that you've got people who are at low risk presenting themselves with the healthy attender effect. So you automatically think you're doing some good because you're picking up stuff early, but that would have happened anyway. You'd have already got a, a good treatment. The, the problem with breast cancer screening and to a certain extent with health checks is um, you, you get overdiagnosis. So you diagnose bona fide cancers in the breast cancer screening programme, but they would never have progressed an invasive cancer that would have done harm 
without the breast cancer programme. And the problem is if that's focused on women who are already well off and already have a long life expectancy, you're putting more resources into that group that can never then reach other groups in society. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying is exactly right about true preventative health care. It is outside of health care, it's social justice, it's fair food laws, it's tobacco laws, it's um, active commuting, it's being able to play outside with your kids knowing that you're not going to get run over by a car, it's safe places to go to work, it's um, fair laws, um, fair employment laws, it's fair, fair, um, fair play from ATOS, the Department of Work and Pensions, um, the, the absolute carnage in the benefit system has created so much stress and hassle for my patients. I'm daily heartbroken by the effect it has on people. So all those things have a profound effect on health, but I am unable to influence them as a GP. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to come here and tell you about them, but I would love to see um, this committee take flight and sort of start to say, actually, to get real preventative health care, we need far more than the NHS. Coming back to the points that were made in terms of the discrepancies in uptake, even if we use screening and picking on Helene's about the education. The affluent managed to understand the health messages we put forward. In Glasgow in particular, we developed campaigns to promote screening programs like cervical that we tested on the least affluent and what happens time and again, there's lower uptake among those that actually need it most. Mm -hmm. And all the wider influencers are at play to prevent mm -hmm. people from the least affluent to actually engage with, the, with, the, with whatever we put forward. Mm -hmm. So the only way to, to be effective is to have policies that make the, easy cho the, the right cho uh, choices easy uh, choices. If I'm looking at breast screening in particular, a lot, we know that obesity is a factor that actually um, drives breast cancers. Uh, breastfeeding is indeed pr uh, protective, but also a number of cancers appear simply because of the amount of alcohol women drink. Mm -hmm. So this... Uh, primary prevention. Now, if we are going to have effective obesity uh, policies that actually are going to have the right foods and increase the, uh, reduce the calorie density in the foods and the right nutrients, in 20 years time we'll be here arguing whether it made a difference or not, or how much money have we spent. Because if something doesn't appear, we can't count it and we don't know what actually made the difference. The reality is fairly complex and it's really hard to attribute co causality to a lot of interventions. We have seen with other screening programs, moving on from the breast to the treble A, where we had randomized controlled trial evidence in terms of the effectiveness. We put it in place in, in, um, in Scotland. And because of the changes in how we dealt with cardiovascular disease and the preventative agenda, Luckily, we do not find the number of cases that we expected simply because the world has moved on. Mm -hmm. So it's how do we, I think my issue is how do we get smart and understand that the world is constantly moving, what we believe is going to deliver might not necessarily in the new context, not necessarily give us or give us something very different. So we need to have a constant process of assessing what we do and readjust our efforts. <laughs> Particular, you were really focused on data-driven. And although I spend most days analyzing data, more so than most consultant colleagues, because I'm particularly focused on data analysis, routinely collected data, I um, would accuse you of being excessively uh, impressed by a data-driven approach. Some of this... <laughs> Some of this is just plain common sense. If you make it harder for people to eat rubbish and drink alcohol, um, a whole range of things will improve. They're going to have less ischemic heart disease, less of about 15 different types of cancers, maybe 25 different types of cancers. We know that tobacco is about 25, 30 different types of cancers, and we know that obesity now is a major risk factor for breast cancer, as Amelia has just said. So if you reduce the ability of the public to eat rubbish and high-fat foods, you you'll improve a whole range of diseases. There's no chance in, 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 um, in heaven of actually measuring uh, um, perfectly or even um, remotely what the impact was. You just improve the obesity and a whole range of diabetes um, will improve. So I don't need a data-driven approach. We only know that stuff because the data tells us that. I sense you've seen this committee before, uh, Dr. Reverend, but um, Tom wants to come in on Sorry. a supplementary on this, then I'll bring Marie in. Sorry. It's a very specific supplementary, and good morning and thank you, convener. Just, I very much appreciate the points that Dr. Reverend is making, but would, would you not agree that these unhealthy lifestyles, uh, propensity to drink excessively, to eat poor food, 
in themselves they are symptoms of economic inequality, low pay, to use a, a, an old-fashioned word, alienation, and the dehumanising effect of precarious work. Now, simply removing access to cheap alcohol and food, it doesn't take away what's motivating people to pursue that. I would just like to comment on that particular problem and that tension. I just would point out to you that middle class people also pig out, uh -huh. drink too much alcohol, increasingly so. So it's not just a problem for the poor and the unemployed. But I absolutely agree with you. I've always been focused on the poverty issue first because that is a social injustice. So that's why I keep banging on about the spirit level. So what we have to do is examine why living in this world is stressful and why a, a substantial minority has been left behind. So that's how you really tackle public health. But on top of reducing the gap between the rich and the poor in terms of income and wealth and opportunity, education and so on, you also have to introduce public health protective policy, which is why I'm very proud of the Scots for beating the English to their, the, the ban on smoking in public places. That was absolutely a fantastic piece of legislation and we did it first in Scotland. So you have to have a number of approaches. You have to have good quality health education, which is available nationally. You have to have GPs promoting healthy lifestyles and identifying high-risk patients, but it, your priority has to be reducing the gap in income and wealth, and you must never forget that, because if you forget that, you end up going down a whole bunch of tangents, which we're, where we are at the moment, lots of different initiatives that are giving us a low return on the investment. Okay. Thank you. I'm just interested in the, again, the, the bias almost that's going towards the screening programs and the interventions, and I suppose as a paediatrician, I'm a glass half full person and I have a lot of faith in children. And I think that we've seen preventive health um, initiatives that have worked because children and young people have adopted them. And taking that approach of everyone can help themselves as well as the state perhaps supporting them to do that has a lot of potential. I think that when people talk about the worried well, one of the things that worried well often miss is the risks and benefits of the decisions they're making and I think Margaret made early on the comment about um, giving people facts about the risks of interventions and the risks of screening programs as well as the potential benefits. From my perspective as a paediatrician I see worried parents of children in various um, from wellness to illness but I think that very often giving facts for the the benefits and the risks of whatever intervention is important and not just going for the programme that offers an, an intervention of itself. I think the Scottish initiative of the Daily Mile in schools has been an enormous success and has applied to all children and all so social groups. And I certainly see children and young people where giving them the respect to make the right decision for their own needs has a hugely positive impact on their self-esteem and self-confidence. And then their potential to be peer supporters of other young people to make change begin to happen from the inside out. I remember some years ago, Bathgate Academy presenting what the pupils had done in changing the attitude of their entire school to keeping themselves fit because they owned the programme and took it forward for themselves. And I think there are a lot of potential areas where a different attitude to preventive health could reap benefits for possibly a lot less cost than some of the, the major programmes that are in place at present. Amelia. Thank you. I, picking on the, the argument about the, the environment and poverty driving people to drink excessively, in terms of alcohol consumption, the most affluent drink just as much as the least affluent. And we know that they're the, if you're in, in the least affluent diesel, as a male, you're 16 times more likely to die from that compared to the most affluent person. So the unhealthy behaviors are pervasive within society. The other thing in Glasgow, it would be remiss of me not to mention the problem with, we have with drugs, heroin, but also the new psychotropes. And we see deaths and in fairly near, nearly close to me, people that actually have experienced within their families deaths in very young people. So. Looking at the evidence and what works is actually offering people, young people, alternatives. And uh, Yuna mentioned giving people the choice to do something else. So if you look at Iceland, they simply engage families, they um, 
and children in alternatives, what actually they're interested in. Some are interested in sports, some are interested in cultural activities. So we need to create an environment that engages people in something that they care about and they really want to participate. Food needs to be the right food, not the junk um, you get at the, the counters. And alcohol has to be more expensive. We have seen through the school survey in Glasgow that the least affluent children now take buy less alcohol because they do not have the pocket money. Um, so it's, it's having the right policies as well. Extremely tight for time this morning, so could we really be sh short, sharp with questions and answers? Um, Marie. Um, I'm very interested in this tension between being data-driven or evidence-based medicine and um, intuitively sensible. Um, and I think it's an issue throughout medicine, but it's probably a particular issue in public health. I wanted to ask you about the flu vaccine, which a number of people mentioned as, a, as a, an area where the evidence, and you know, I think a Cochrane review a few years ago raised some questions about how much difference the flu vaccine had made um, to our health and um, and yet in, you, you use the term intuitively sensible to, to use the flu vaccine. And I just wonder why, why do we take that different approach with a vaccine versus, you know, you raise lots of questions about a screening program. And it, is that because the costs of vaccination are less? So there is a, there is a, a cost for the drug, there is a, but there's very little harm done clinically to people who get a flu vaccine unnecessarily. But there would obviously be an opportunity cost. So I just wondered if, I, if either of you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, flu vaccine is different from MMR and things like that because flu changes every year and you have to predict what you think the flu outbreak is going to be like. and that's It's not at all effective. That's, that's right, and that, that's the problem. So where things like MMR are highly effective, they're very, very good, I think there are legitimate questions to be asked about flu vaccination. There's high-quality evidence that says that if you have significant underlying lung disease, you're far more likely to benefit. So if you've got really bad chronic bronchitis, you're a, a group that's very likely to benefit. But it's the healthy adults who just happen to be older. That's the group that I worry about. And I really worry that GPs get targets for payment to hit payment for vaccination as opposed to informed choice about vaccination. So to me, it should be the GP's choice choice to start, the GP's job to say here is an intervention, here are the pros, here are the cons, what would you like to do and that should be the, the intervention it should not be that we're paid to do more where some people actually for all kinds of reasons just don't want to have it but I think the decision that has to be made out with the general practitioner and a, and a person to person basis is what are Scottish Government willing to fund, do we think that doing this for everyone is the best use of this resources or could our doctors and nurses be doing something better with their time and that is very often what, what will happen in a consultation I, like many GPs, I start early and I finish late to give a little bit more time to every patient. And I want that time to be for that patient to talk to what is important to them about. I would like to have a dialogue as opposed to a very directed thing where I'm saying, OK, time for your vaccination now. Whereas a person might say, actually, I, I just want to talk about the bereavement of you know, the death of my father, or I'm worried about the symptom that I've got, or actually I'm concerned my depression's coming back again. That kind of thing. And it's very hard to capture that kind of nuance from... from from where opportunity cost goes and I'm just really worried that we're almost turning general practice into a factory setting where everyone automatically gets the same thing rather than making a really high quality choice. So. Okay, Marie. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask about was the A&E 4-hour target. So um, a couple of people mentioned that in their submissions that that had uh, driven attention into A&E. When Harry Burns came and spoke to us about targets, we all agreed that there were real problems with some of the targets set. But actually, it seemed that that one came out as being quite a useful target. It was a canary in the mine target. So it told us not about particularly what was happening in the a &E. It tells us something about what's happening in the a &E, but it tells us about what's the, the health of the whole system. So who is coming in for unscheduled care, how many cases of unscheduled care are appearing and where they move on to within the hospital. So it seemed actually that was a reasonably, to me, it looked like a reasonably useful target compared to some of the others. Um, do you want to give me some thoughts on that? I could say that the four-hour target um, seems rather illogical on its own. I think that, again, going back to what question you want to answer when you ask the question is important, because taking the data from a four-hour target without setting the, the questions beforehand simply tells you 
how many people are seen within four hours. If the people that are being seen didn't need to be there in the first place, then the four hour target is meaningless. And so working back from the target to say, is the target all that we need or is there something more to that? One of the issues, I work as a hospital doctor and see people who come to hospital and many of them could have been seen in another way, led me to ask what people are advised about how to find help for their health. And we've heard a lot about GPs, but sometimes there are other people who could answer some of the questions that end up with someone coming to an emergency department. For instance, I have a headache and no paracetamol. I need paracetamol and I go to hospital, which is completely illogical. Unless you think that maybe that's the only place that person knew to get help when they don't feel well. And so I think, again, going back to young people, to ensure that young people are aware of how to look after their health and their symptoms might be a, an important part of looking at the ED four-hour targets. So I think the, the target, I don't know why four hours was the magic number, but I think as a doctor, the clinical priority is much more important than the number of minutes or hours somebody waits to be seen. Um, Amelia, first, very briefly, and then Helen. We know that um, when we have busy emergency departments, the mortality increases in people who attend hospitals. So we need to find a balance whereby we have the right um, venues for people to attend when they need care. Um, targets are, arbitrary, uh, are arbitrarily set, and if we have targets, we just find ways to manage the target, not necessarily the patients. So it's how do we take a whole system approach, as Yuna mentioned, to ensure that we see the right people in the right place um, and not just mind the four-hour target. Helen. The target was introduced in 2007, and I believe that it was useful at that time because it attracted attention to unscheduled care and a &E in particular. It um, encouraged the hospitals to invest in the uh, A&E service, to hire more A&E staff and so on, and the quality of that service improved and the waiting time experience improved dramatically. So between 2007 and 2010, the compliance performance in Scotland, including in our health board, was excellent. But thereafter, it deteriorated, and in our health board in particular, it deteriorated markedly with extremely low troughs, down to 70%, for instance. And now we're starting to go back to those really appalling statistics. And that's because the four-hour A&E target collapse is a reflection of the inadequacy of the community-based services. And if you ignore the alarm bells when they keep going off intermittently every winter in particular, and you don't address the inadequacy of social care of the elderly, district nursing, GPs, and other base, community-based services, what's the point of continuing to measure that four-hour target if you don't address the root cause of the problem and you simply hire more A&E consultants, which is what we have been doing for, for many, many years. So I am not... Um, a fan of it anymore. I think it's outlived its usefulness. My final question is um, on breastfeeding. So I'm delighted that you raised the issue, you know, and I'll just pick up on that. I think um, in terms of health prevention um, of illness, it has an implication in a lot of things that we've been talking about today, like uh, breast cancer and in obesity. It's interesting that immediately when the topic of breastfeeding was raised, we, we thought about, you know, thinking of this graph that we have of lifestyle drift. So we thought about the interventions in terms of education and telling people that they should breastfeed rather than the, the issues which create a culture where breastfeeding is easier, like in some of the Scandinavian countries where regulation of marketing is tighter, where um, economic inequality is less acute. So I'd be very interested if you could give me some thoughts on, on that quickly, if there are things that we could do yeah, other I than education to improve breastfeeding. Uh, thank you. Um, I think there are lots of things we could do. And um, I see, I, I work in neonatal care, so I see lots of babies and their mums. And I think that it is impressive to have one-to-one -one support for a mum trying to breastfeed is for me the thing that makes the biggest difference and that leads on in terms of health economics to the need for the people who can support mothers in the community um, and that is health visitors in the professional sense but also peer supporters um, in the community. I think in Scotland we have had 
quite a challenge for the culture to change. I think in wartime, women were encouraged to go out to work and bottle feed with national dried. And that culture is now two generations old, but it takes a long time to change. Because at that time, I think the, the media, and now we have media involved even more um, actively, the media at that time promoted formula feeding because the women were needed. And to come away from that and see that actually that wasn't the best way to feed your baby means a whole culture changing um, its beliefs. And so I think there's a lot of need for that. I think the social discrimination between different income groups um, is something that we shouldn't accept as a given, that there are lots of um, women in lower socioeconomic <coughs> groups who would love to breastfeed if they were given the support to do that. And I think that's where we should be targeting. Again, it's like the, the Daily Mile, that if we assume that one group won't breastfeed, then they won't breastfeed. And it may be, again, targeting the extra input to encourage the positive benefits and let people enjoy breastfeeding their babies, which is what it's all about. And the babies will be the next generation who hopefully will then be healthier and less obese and improve the economics of Scotland. I'm going to have to move on. We've got five people in five minutes left. So, uh, Tom. Very quickly, with regard to screening and given particularly the prominence of false positives, to what extent in the discussions um, that occur between screening and intervention is realistic medicine actually being practised? And if I could just ask as a supplementary um, to comment particularly on the cultural um, drivers of demand and within healthcare and within regards to the preventative agenda and specifically what role um, in altering these cultural demands, uh, culturally driven demands, do you think health boards and government has? For anyone who wishes to ask. I, I, well, I, I'm really worried. I'll, I'll, I, I'm really concerned that the invitations and the adverts for screening always emphasise the importance of attending screening. They don't encourage shared decision making, so they don't encourage people to make a decision that's based on their values and what they prefer to do themselves. And I think that's the biggest cultural problem that there is. GPs very much are trained to believe in patient autonomy and in giving people um, good information on which to base their decision. But the invitations are sent from a central agency with my name on them. So names, um, invitations go out with my name and I'm saying, Dr McCarty says it's time for your, your cervical screening, you have to come along for it now, essentially, without really giving people information about the potential for false positives and the potential for overtreatment. Now, I think women who want to have cervical screening should be absolutely supported to do so, but I think we have to be very respectful of people who, for whatever reason, have decided that they don't want to have it, and I do not think that that's embedded in the current system just now. Could I just um, comment on the Realistic Medicine mm. document, which I think has been a very positive um, and positively received document in relation to antibiotic treatment, when you asked about the uh, pros and cons and how it's presented, I think that there is a huge potential to change people's um, demands, if you like, on the health mm -hmm. service by truly allowing them to understand the, the benefits and the risks of the treatment that they might think would be the right one for them. And very often they can change their attitude. But it does take time and it does take person to person. And I think that the the one-to-one -one with the media backup is a very effective way to go but media alone is not going to be enough so if someone comes asking for an antibiotic and you say the antibiotic may make you have a tummy upset and may cause resistant organisms when in fact you probably have a viral illness that won't respond anyway then I find that most people would go for not having an antibiotic but it does take that brief discussion to to make sense of it why would anyone understand if you didn't give them the explanation? We know that there's there's good evidence that if you have a continuous relationship with your healthcare professional, you're more likely to be satisfied with your care and less likely to in increase costs. So your care is cheaper, you tend to get less interventions and overall people prefer it. Okay, I talk. actually have, um, think that there's some wonderful material in the realistic medicine documents, but I'm also concerned that there's a bit of a conflicting message, that the government has encouraged the concept of screening generally and encouraged people to go see their GP at the drop of a hat, including if you have a cough for more than three weeks. By the way, I've had a cough for something like eight weeks, and I get it every winter, and I've had it for many years now, and I certainly don't go to the GP about it. Um, I just worry that w with one in one voice, we've encouraged people to become a little bit health neurotic and look for disease and worry that every time they have a lump or a bump or a sniffle, that there's something seriously wrong with them. And then we issue a document that says, we now need to start practicing realistic medicine. 
uh, well, it's a bit late now. We've got a, a huge um, cultural demand, which you just mentioned, which is going to be very hard to put back in the bottle. And I think governments have to take some responsibility, particularly south of the border, where, for instance, they encouraged people to uh, screen for depression. And then we saw an increase in prescribing of antidepressants thereafter. We're looking for prostatic cancer, encouraging people to get the PSA test done when we know it's not a good idea to screen the general population for PSA or the male population. So I think the government has to be consistent now in the future, otherwise we'll not get out of the problems that we're currently experiencing. Okay, Jenny. Good morning to the panel. Um, one of the things that's kind of come out from everyone's uh, submissions this morning uh, has been the need for behaviour change around about uh, preventative uh, medicine uh, on rather the agenda uh, of kind of preventative healthcare. And one of the things you highlighted, Dr. Irvin, was meaningful employment and how that could, you know, essentially help to uh, solve the, the problems that we're facing at the moment. Obviously, the education system has a key role to play in that in terms of giving kids the kind of currency to trade in the marketplace through their qualifications. So I just wonder, in terms of health education, if there's a need to reconfigure what we understand health education to mean, and if we need to look at behaviour change within the education system in terms of helping, I suppose, to help close the attainment gap between the poorest kids and the richest kids. So by looking at um, one of the things you highlighted, Dr McFadden, was the Daily Mile, for example. I think that's all good and well, but we need to join up uh, physical activity in school, whether that be in PE with the kind of theory behind it. So through kind of, you know, modern studies, we might look at social inequality and linking up behaviour change with that and also looking at food education. I just wonder if the panel has any views on how the education system can play a role in that preventative agenda. Curriculum for Excellence just before coming to this meeting. And I think there is a huge potential to um, incorporate more about keeping your own health as it should be within the curriculum. There are big topics that will be presented in a number of ways like sexual health and um, improvement. But th that one-to-one, -one, the, the, the respect for the individual, I guess, I think is very important in relation to health. And young people themselves have recently um, carried out a survey with the Scottish Government um, and identified their mental health as something of concern. Now that's a, a population saying, I want help. And we should be ready to address that, to go with what people feel they want, because behaviour change happens when you want to be helped. And I think that's back to listening to the users as much as imposing a service from, from outside. I think Amelia commented on that too, about addressing what people want to know about. Just picking up in terms of the role of the education, we have to have the right environments and we have to have them very, very early. We screen, we screen children in the preschool year doing vision screening and in the East End of Glasgow, the orthoptics came back and said, you know, there are children who can't name common objects. So how do we actually ensure that children, by the time they reach school, they have the cognitive ability to engage with the educational system? So we need a preschool, um, that has to be available for all children, particularly those from the least affluent. We need to have the bedtime stories. We need to engage families very early to support them because by the time they're 10, 11, it's a bit late. Yep. Do you think that there's a role for the health uh, service or a GP or somebody from the healthcare industry to come into schools and to speak to children more readily about how they access the appropriate healthcare professional because that's one of the key points that's been highlighted today. Folk are going to A&E when they don't need to. You know, you want to change behaviour. Well, try and get into the, the next generation and teach those behaviours uh, accordingly. Do you think there's a role then for the healthcare uh, industry as opposed to have more of an input? I know that uh, Medics Against Violence, for example, do inputs into schools uh, in Glasgow and across the country and they go and they speak to secondary pupils um, about their work and that helps to kind of develop understanding. Do you think there's a role then for, for a better link up between education and health there? Yes, you could teach children to do everything you want, but you have to remember that the curriculum is already really tight, and as you all have read in the Herald today, there are difficulties with teaching, with the pressures on the budgets and so on, achievement. So uh, I, I think it's a bit utopian to think that we can now teach the general public at a very early age how to use the NHS. As far as the abuse of A&E is concerned, 
Tay Side has cracked it by having a redirection policy. Somebody goes in, they're triaged by a nurse who says, you're not really supposed to be using the A&E for this. Go and use the pharmacy. This is where it's located at this hour. You need to use your GP in the morning, and their GPs are geared up for taking them the next morning. And their A&E attendance rates are a fraction of those in our health board. So you don't need to teach all children not to abuse the A&E at school. You can actually teach the, very, the, the patient the very first time they abuse it with a redirection policy. And I believe that's where the Scottish A&E departments will increasingly be moving out of necessity. We simply cannot cope with the unnecessary attendances. I would just add that Sorry, very briefly, we'll have to move on. Um, just adding to that, that rather than waiting till they go to A&E, which will be important in itself, I think school nurses are a, a force that could be utilised to help young people to feel confident about using health services. And I think it's unfair on young people to expect them to know by instinct or following what their parents have always done to use the NHS as we see it appropriately. Okay, Donald? Yes, following on from that, we talked about education. I, I just want to ask about the methods we use to communicate sort of preventative health messages to, to the public. Um, you know, th there are obviously a range of things we've done. We all remember the very striking, powerful national advertising campaigns. Uh, the, we all know about the, the posters in a GP surgery, the use of social media. But in a sentence, what are we doing right and what are we doing wrong? Um, and particularly in terms of reaching uh, the unworried unwell in perhaps highly deprived, um, you know, deprived communities who may not have internet access, may not have um, ready access to broadcast media, etc. Say use the children because I think we had smoke busters in Stirling and they were the most effective force for stopping smoking in public places before the act came in. I think if children know and believe a message, they'll get it to their parents. So maybe one way is to start young. What we do right in Scotland is having the right policy. So we are, we were brave enough to have the banning in uh, public places. We're brave enough to go with the minimum pricing mm -hmm. on alcohol. Um, and we have to be brave enough to say this is the right foods you need to eat and the, the industry will follow. And we see the readjustment of the sugar content in the soft drinks on the back of the sugar tax. So its policy will, will affect everyone and it will not rely on intelligent processing of uh, information that has to be there and then enabled through behaviours. I actually think that most people know what they should be doing. They know they should be eating more fruit and vegetables, but they don't like them, or they're not used to eating them. Their parents never gave it to them, so they just don't have a palate for, for vegetables. Um, and the way to encourage them to consume more of the healthy food is to make the healthy food cheaper and the expensive food more expensive. So I think we should be taxing junk food and subsidizing fruit and vegetables and, and subsidize the whole wheat bread. Imagine if it was 15 pence and the white bread was a pound 20. A lot of um, people would eat the, the um, whole wheat bread. Evidence-based policy making, doing some of it right, but also doing some of it wrong. Everything should be driven by evidence and we should get rid of stuff that doesn't work. You have a, a staff in the NHS that will, you know, that love working in the NHS who are driven by vocation and yet that keeps getting subverted mm -hmm. by asking us to do the wrong, ineffective stuff. Okay, thanks, Donald. Um, the, in Dr Irvin's evidence, uh, when we start to ask about the preventative agenda, um, the answer says the implication in the question is that there are wonderful in initiatives out there to prevent ill health and premature death, we, but we simply can't measure the cost effectiveness and need to try harder to demonstrate their existence and their value for money. The truth is that the, the, the wonderful initiative is staring us in the face. It's to equalise opportunity and reduce income and wealth gap and use existing powers to do so. I. I couldn't agree with that more. I think, you know, th all of those issues outside health are the issues that we have to tackle um, around structural change in the economy, fair work, um, fair pay, all of that stuff. Do you see evidence that that's happening? And I'm distressed at how little people talk about it. I feel like I'm ostracized and a bit of an oddball for um, raising it. I feel it's my job to do so, and I'm not going to stop doing that uh, for the rest of my career. It's absolutely essential, and my fervent belief in that comes from being brought up in Canada uh, under Pierre Elliott Trudeau in the 70s, when the gap between rich and poor in the 60s and 70s, I was actually born in 1957, um, the gap between rich and poor was very narrow, and I will never forget 
um, Canada in those days and, and seeing it change as it went into the 80s, which is when I decided to leave to come to the UK. We have to reduce that gap. We have to um, show commitment to young people. And I am a product of that attitude. Um, I don't think I would be what I am today if I was born in Canada today because it's now much more like America. There is a much bigger gap um, and that is the way to go. And if we continue to tolerate huge accumulation of wealth on the part of a tiny minority, we're just going to have more and more problems and you can't, there's no, not enough millions of pounds available in the public sector to rectify it. You can't solve it with um, health promotion, with um, health screening and no, none of that is going to work. You you have to reduce that gap, and that has to be the priority. Amelia? It's a very, very difficult question, and we're, we're not, in spite of our wef efforts, uh, closing the gap. But in unequal societies, what we can do in terms of narrowing the gap is the very early education. So there's good evidence that neighborhood-based education in the kind of first year of life is going to promote social mobility, and that's the one thing we can do. Abandoning in, uh, any willingness to tackle redistribution I sincerely hope that that is going to come there there are some measures that have been put in place but we we need to be bolder than that it doesn't mean that it's going to be the final solution because we will require vaccination programs we will require many other things um, in addition to it final point and on the screening stuff if the money was no object would you still get rid of it Yes, I'll have to see. Modified. Yes to that. It, do, it does. Yeah, harm. targeted. Make yeah. it targeted for yeah. the higher risk women. You're still doing harm, you know. So you're creating avoidable harms. That's the problem, and that avoidable harm is something you want to try and get rid of. And you can always spend money on something better. Can I just see the screening for babies? Um, is a different issue. Yeah. 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 So please, yeah. not don't take all screening away. <laughs> there are many screen programs that are worthwhile. Um, even if there weren't many money, a lot of money, I would continue with those ones. Um, if you allow to individuals to do whatever they please, you can go to the States and you'll see huge disparities because the wealthy, they will think, on balance, I can have my mammography every year as opposed to the three-yearly program the UK is offering. And most countries actually do mammography every two years. So we need to be critical in terms of what we offer to whom, but just allowing a free-for-all, it will widen inequalities even more than currently yeah. okay thank you very much can i say I, I i really welcome this session because we need challenging papers like this and we need challenging discussions like this and i think it's it's very healthy that we we, we have that um thanks very much for attending this one and we'll um, suspend briefly to change the panel
The uh, second item on our agenda is an evidence session with the uh, NHS National Waiting Time Centre. Um, some members of the committee had the benefit of visiting the Golden Jubilee Hospital back in September, and we thank you very much for hosting us on that occasion. Could I welcome to the committee Jill Young, the Chief Executive, uh, Julie Carter, Director of Finance, Mike Higgins, uh, Medical Director, and June Rogers, Director of Operations, all from the National uh, Waiting Times Centre. Um, Jill, I think you're going to give us an opening statement, are you? Yeah. Yes, yes, just very briefly, okay. thank you. Um, and I'm sorry I wasn't there for your visit, and I'm, I'm delighted that it was of, of use to see what we do. That's it. <laughs> yes, I did indeed, thank you. Uh, no, we're delighted to um, make a brief introduction to the committee um, to tell you about the unique nature of our board, which is quite different from any other health board in Scotland, indeed in the UK. Um, we're delighted that next month we're celebrating our 15th year anniversary in the NHS. Um, 15 very successful years, um, we believe. Um, but where we started as a national waiting time centre, purely set up to address elective waiting time targets, as they were at the time, where you could have been waiting many years just if a cataract operation. We have changed radically and significantly over the years, and hence we're more commonly known as the Golden Jubilee Foundation. I would like to highlight, although the, we do a whole range of services for the people of Scotland, that really we have three core specialties, which are our core purpose of, of, of being there. Um, the first one is our Heart and Lung Centre, one of Europe's largest cardiothoracic centres, providing a whole range of services. From west of Scotland, all adult cardiac surgery. Um, we treat not just elective, but all the emergency heart attacks come to us by blue light ambulance or helicopter to be treated at the Golden Jubilee, up to our national heart and lung services, and the best known of those are, of course, the heart transplant, where it's done once for Scotland, based out at the Golden Jubilee Hospital. The second core purpose and specialty is our orthopaedic department. Again, it's one of your Europe's best known departments and one of the largest, with pioneering work that's now been replicated not only across Scotland and the UK, but further afield into Europe. 25% of every hip and knee replacement in Scotland was done at the Golden Jubilee and with tremendous successful outcomes. So it's not just about activity and numbers, it's actually about the clinical outcomes and the performance and the satisfaction of patients. They're now moving into taking that into more um, health, telehealth and telemedicine and orthopaedics and are doing outreach clinics up into the Highlands and Islands um, and into Fife, for example. The third core business we have, which sounds as if it's quite, um, quite a short procedure to have is a cataract procedure. Um, and now it's done, it takes about half an hour in theatres to have your cataract um, removed and replaced with a lens. Um, and it's almost t totally as day case work. But we do 18 to 20% of every single cataract that's done People travel from all over Scotland, even the Highlands and Islands, to come to the Jubilee to have their cataracts. One, because of the excellence of the team and the expertise that we have, but also about the clinical outcomes and the speed that we can um, deliver that service for them. I'd like to ju just finish very briefly by mentioning two other dimensions that we are unique in having um, as a national board. I, um, which is critical to underpin our success. And that's that we have our own four-star conference hotel, which is quite unique, not just in Scotland or the UK, but into Europe, and our Research and Innovation Institute. Um, in our research department, we are now running about 80 research projects with international interest um, and input to them um, to benefit the patients of Scotland. And we've completely refocused the hotel's business to be a conference centre of excellence and to focus on residential training conferences with highly specialised equipment for healthcare and the public sector, so we went even beyond the NHS. But finally, the thing that really has made us so successful in our performance over the last 15 years is our staff. I mean, their dedication and enthusiasm, their commitment to constantly go the extra mile and to look to improve at every turn uh, and, and, to, and to make things better has just been tremendous. We underpin that with training and human factors and values and culture, not just in the professional side of their training for doctors and nurses and allied health professionals. So it's down to them really that we have such high quality and continue to improve in our innovation. So I'll finish there if, if okay. that's all right. Thank you. Uh, Ivan? Yeah. Thanks, convener, and thanks for coming along this morning. And I just say I also enjoyed the visit to the uh, Golden Jubilee last year. Um, what I want to focus down on is uh, we've got some data in front of us that um, I'm assuming you'll, you'll agree with, which is around about the cost per um, get this right um, cost per case. Um, it's defined as cost per inpatient case. Um, 
at uh, the waiting time centre compared to a range of other hospitals, and yours is significantly higher. Um, so I'd just like to unpick that a wee bit and understand if we're comparing apples with oranges here, given the nature of what you're doing. And, and then I'd like to go a wee bit further and understand um, how you get loaded up with demand from other health boards and whether your underutilisation has got an impact on cost, etc., etc. And that's something we should, we should be leveraging more. But first of all, you can just maybe explain why the numbers, as we are seeing in front of us here, are significantly higher. Maybe start off and hand over to yeah. Julie, she can give you the detail. So the complexity of what we do, so for example in our the national services, they're completely different, so that you're not comparing apples with apples, that's the first point. We also try to change the pathway of care, so we're not bringing patients on unnecessary journeys down to the Golden Jubilee, so we would put on alternative ways of treating them in terms of outreach. So for example, we send our ophthalmology team up to Orkney and Shetland and up into the Highlands to treat patients, which would be an additional cost to us, but a saving to that local health board in that local community and population. So there is, it is not apples and apples that we're comparing in it, um, but I'll maybe hand over to Julie for the detail. Yeah, so just to, to kind of, you know, obviously re kind of reiterate that is that you're absolutely looking at apples and oranges. So if you look at, for example, orthopaedics, so, so because all of our work is joints, the average cost of the implant going into the joint is about 1,500 to kind of 2,000 pounds. When you're comparing to other health boards, a lot of their work will will be obviously fracture work, which doesn't have joints. So that's one of the big differences you've got, is that we are absolutely unique and it is 100% elective work. So we don't have any accident emergency work coming through. Fine, so we take that to the next stage then. I mean, is there data that compares apples with apples then? What you're doing compared to... Right, and how do your costs compare on that basis? Yes, yeah, very, very good. So we absolutely compare our costs for, you know, if you look at joints and because our... Our average length of stay is only three days, whereas you'll probably find across across Scotland the average length of stay will probably be about five days. Then our cost comes out really, really good. And we're extremely focused on that because we have to be. We have to be. We are an elective factory, so we have to be extremely efficient and we have to be looking all the time to make things better. That's what I've expected because that model should work like that. And of Absolutely. course, the big advantage is it should be a lot cheaper. Um, so if that's the case, you've got the data that says that you're cheaper than other health boards doing similar process, um, you're doing 25% of hip and knee, 20% of cataract from across Scotland, but you've got an underutilisation of capacity at 60 odd percent, and clearly with it being planned, it should be and could be a lot, lot higher than that. Um, why, is, why are you not more fully loaded? Is there a resistance in the part of health boards to give you more um, operations to carry out? Is there a, something in the costing system that creates uh, that makes it look cheaper for them to do it in house when it isn't really, or, or, or what's the issues behind that? No, no. Um could maybe tease out just what you mean by underutilisation because at the yeah. moment we are actually full so our capacity ah, right, okay. in terms of the hospital the board's resources okay. we are absolutely full and indeed we're working six days a week in some of the ah, specialties right, okay. so the um and part of the expansion plans for the new elective center is actually so that we can accommodate more orthopedics and take that 25 percent up higher right okay now it's just uh, we get data here that says you're at 68 percent occupancy versus a target of 73 to 85 so that, sorry, that's occupancy within some of the wards. Right, okay, so, so that's not on the operations. No, no right, so, not okay, the operations. So no. Leave that to one yeah. side. Okay, so taking that to the next stage then, what would need to happen for you to do more work given that it is cheaper for you to do it than for other health boards to do it? Quality. Of course. It's the quality that actually drives yeah. the, the yeah. efficiency in it rather than yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, No, but it is important because I've never seen a, an efficient, a finance target delivering high quality, but I've seen high quality targets delivering the efficiency. So um, it's the expansion we need to do. We are actually running six days a week. We're exploring some of the services seven days a week, so seven day working, which we do in the physiotherapy department, the occupational therapy. But to get the theatres running seven days a week, you need more staff, you need more resources, you need more supply so okay. we're exploring that currently and um, to squeeze out every part of the current resources we have but there would need to be an expansion on the golden jubilee which is under planning at the moment and just lastly there was also some data in here on cancellations um it came out just under three percent i think is that a number you recognize or and again it came out higher than pretty much every other health board but again i'm a well i don't know maybe tell me or again not comparing like with like there 
Yeah, it's a, bit, it's a bit of both because cancellations that we have, so a number of our patients don't come to us for the first outpatient attendance, whereas Bos will count that in the cancellation, so it's not apples and apples. That is, it's not acceptable 3%. We're working hard to get that down. Perhaps June can tell you she drives some of the work to do that. Some of it's related to the distance that patients have to travel, and if they deem the amount of time that they've had to wait or their own circumstances, then we do get cancellations if they tend to live further away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, sir, can I just squeeze yeah, one very last one in? Um, there's clearly a, a strategic intent to replicate what you do elsewhere, and this might be a, a question you might not want to answer directly, but um, given the nature of what you're doing and given it's obviously planned and elective and given you're pretty good at it on that site, if you had to consider whether it made sense to invest that money in doing it in other locations around the country and having to start from scratch and build up that expertise, or to invest more in what you're doing in double and treble in your capacity, which do you think makes the most sense? We're looking at both at the moment. Okay. So the elective capacity expansion is looking at both how much can we expand and do on the Golden Jubilee site and what is best to be delivered locally. So there are certain procedures should be done locally. There is no need for patients to travel to us. Um, but you have to consider the resources, not just the physical, the money, but the, the technology and the equipment and the recruitment of staff. And sometimes that can be quite challenging in smaller sites. Back to your point about what we are doing, the actual model of care for the planning of the new elective centres is the Golden Jubilee model of care, and we've been asked to take a lead role in that to make sure that even if there is expansion in other areas around Scotland, that they will then be run and operated on the same model of care that we use. OK, and I, and I suppose, sorry, very finally, if everybody did what you were doing, how much would we save across the health board? You might not know the answer to that, you might want to get back to me on that. A lot. But if you can get, maybe get back to me with some analysis on that, I'd appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks. That we do we do work very very closely with other health boards so it's not a kind of them and us and we share models with them um, and we obviously share with them if we're able to do things better so we work very much on a kind of cohesive basis with them. Okay. Um, Donald? Yeah, and, uh, likewise it's good to see some of you again after the visit last se September. Um, I'd like to um, concentrate on one of the issues that Ivan raised and that's the cancelled operations because I think this is a, a, a real problem actually. Um, the um, with the exception of a couple of months last year, I think you were above the Scottish average uh, for the whole year. And as has been said, you were the second highest in Scotland. Um, uh, due to, uh, these are operations cancelled due to capacity and non-clinical reasons. My, my first question is, is just to find out why that is. What, what is the reason for, for this, this high, high rate of cancelled operations? Um, there's a couple of things. We have the cardiac programme in there and, um, you know, often cases are cancelled because more urgent cases come in, transplants come in, etc. The other thing is that um, we have a general surgical service that is run by visiting consultants and on occasion, or maybe more, more than on occasion, we will have to cancel lists at fairly short notice because consultants have been held back at their host board with more complex procedures that they have to carry out there. It would be mostly things like um, endoscopy and minor general surgical procedures. Um, additionally, in the cancellations that you're looking at, probably for the last year, we had some equipment issues with um, ophthalmology, and that's large numbers of patients in one day. So that inflates the percentage you're seeing there. So. I think what you're looking at is probably orthopaedics, probably endoscopy, where you're doing up to 14 of these in a day and it doesn't take long to rack up that 3%. Um, the ones we'd be more concerned about, as I say, would be cardiac ones that are being postponed rather than cancelled uh, to make way for more urgent procedures. Um, given a lot of what you do is elective surgery, which I presume is easier to plan, plan in advance for um, by its very nature, um, and you, are, you rightly have a reputa reputation for, for quality and, and being the gold standard and being a national centre of excellence for this. Um, would you accept that um, you're going to have to sort this out to maintain that reputation? We're acutely aware of where the areas that we need to fix. The areas that we have typically concentrated on are orthopaedics and cataracts, etc., as Jill said. And we do perform in the upper quartile in both of those um, services, and, and that's been evidence in peer reviews. 
So I think we work really hard not to cancel patients. We work really hard to, if we cancel a patient, they'll be given a new date at the same day as we're cancelling them. So they're not waiting outside their waiting time guarantees. So we're still able to treat them. It's not a great number, that 3%. And yes, we're working really hard and we're very focused on what we have to do. Okay, uh, Colin. Thanks uh, very much. Can, you, can I just touch on the point um, that you made regarding the challenges of consultants? Also, we have a we have a national shortage of consultants in almost every area. Um, yet um, you're expanding and you're looking to expand. You now, uh, given the figures that, that Donald touched on of um, of cancelled operations, how challenging is it going to be to, to meet that expansion when we you have issues such as um, you know, a shortage of, of consultants and, and some of the points that you made there? start and hand over to Mike to, to give you the detail. Um, there's a number of things we're doing. So the expansion is three to five years away before, you know, well, two years for phase one and then three to five years for phase two, assuming it gets approved. We've set up our own training academies for theatre operating staff and for radiology that have been very successful. So we're actually taking people in and training our own staff. Um, so that they're ready um, when the new expansion happens. There's a number of areas where the services are only delivered at the Golden Jubilee, so when we recruit, we're not, we're not taking staff from other areas in Scotland. We're actually trying to advertise and market um, in the UK and further afield in Europe and internationally to try and recruit into the areas. We've also spent the last 10 to 15 years building our reputation and credibility as the place to come and work to get experience and to get high-quality professional um, career progression um, and we do tend to we do have some a couple of areas where there's shortages um, in certain skills but we do tend to have a number of candidates when we have a vacancy coming forward and today I would say there's only perhaps one specialty that we have where we have not been able to re uh, appoint into that vacancy for doctors for doctors primarily yeah um, so the, the challenges we face are, are, are the same challenges that are faced by the rest of the NHS and, and broadly speaking, um, the solutions we put in place to address those challenges are, are, are the same solutions that are being put in place across the rest of the NHS. So we have looked at what consultants do, um, and we try to use consultants in their roles in so, such that they're doing tasks that only consultants need to do. Um, so, for instance, in the ophthalmology service, um, we've undertaken major redesign so that those parts of the cataract procedures and, and the outpatient um, appointments that can only be done by consultants are done by consultants. Um, and we have used optometrists um, to take over many of the tasks um, that are um, where it, you don't require um, a, a qualified um, eye surgeon um, in, in, in order to do that task. Um, that redesign is ongoing and um, we've reached a certain point in it um, where we've made major efficiencies, major improvements and um, we would like to take it much further um, and that is a process um, in place. Um, our orthopaedic service, um, we've grown from um, when I came to the Jubilee in 2008, I think we had six or seven full-time orthopaedic consultants and we've now got 15 or 16 depending how you count them. Um, and um, there was scepticism at that time as to whether a centre which concentrated on a relatively small number of electric, ele uh, elective procedures um, could attract people for a professional career. Um, but we found um, by um, um, making that th the, the job intrinsically attractive, um, by concentrating on high standards, um, by um, our recruitment um, process, um, um, which is highly focused on um, non-technical skills, team working um, and um, non-technical competences um, and um, it is rather than just a simple sort of one hour um, um, consultant interview in fact, by making it harder in some ways to be appointed um, we've, we've found that it has become a very attractive place to work um, and people are out there who want to come work in the Golden Jubilee on a, on a, on a, on a wider scale um, I guess if if those consultants are being attracted from elsewhere in the health service, then it's really important that when they're working in the Golden Jubilee, they're working to maximum efficiency, um, so that their, their input into the health service is maximised. Um, I think that works very well. I think there are specialties where, um, uh, uh, as Jill pointed out, particularly where there's a very, very tight, um, super specialised areas, where there's a very um, tight international market, and I'm thinking about areas like heart transplantation, um, our Scottish Pulmonary Vascular Unit, 
um, adult congenital cardiac care, both cardiological and surgical, where there's not only a UK shortage of skills, but there's an international shortage of skills, then we are playing, if you like, on an international market. And we have, we have a number of um, international um, and, and European um, appointments um, to our, 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 our jobs in the Golden Jubilee. You made the point that, that you are, though, sometimes competing with other parts of the health service for, for staff, particularly more routine uh, types of operations. So what, given, given the fact that myself and other members maybe represent sort of more rural areas, um, quite some distance from the Golden Jubilee, patients want to go where they can get the best treatment, but they would also like that to be in the local area if that was at all possible. So how do you think, given the fact you are competing with other parts of the health service for consultants, how do you think the expansion um, of the Golden Jubilee will impact on local services elsewhere in Scotland? So, so, so it should be a win-win situation, and, and we would work really hard at that. Um, I, I think you know there's a sense in which every single appointment in the health service anywhere is in competition with an appointment elsewhere in the health service. Um, what you want to do is to provide um, the maximum um, benefit from those appointments wherever they are, um, and um, that's to do with... Um, so did partly to do with the efficiency that I was talking about, using, using consultants um, um, efficiently. Um, it's also partly to do with um, being creative. So, for instance, we've been looking at split appointments um, where consultants might spend half of their time in one of the, the surrounding geographical boards um, and part of the time in the Golden Jubilee. Um, I, I think that's one practical solution. Um, that's quite a useful... Th one of the issues, for instance... Um, with our um, anaesthetic team is that because we do a fairly limited range of operations um, and because much of it is focused on um, what we would call regional anaesthesia, which means patients aren't put to sleep but their part of the body is numbed in order to carry out the operation, um, then there's a worry that people's um, skills in putting people to sleep are being um, diluted and, and was certainly one of the, um, the solutions to that that we're looking at will be joint appointments where people have um, a general anaesthetic workload in, in one board and then would have, say, um, a, an orthopaedic workload in our board. So I think there are some simple practical things we can do. I think it's really important, um, as Julie mentioned earlier, that we would want that we want to work collaboratively with other boards. We're not setting ourselves up in competition. Um, we want sort of to create win-win situations to, to these sorts of problems. You don't think it'll impact on set local services? Well, I, I don't we work hard so 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 that all the all 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 the services we set up um, are if you like win win so that um, you 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 you'd have to take i mean it's not a it's a very it's a question that it isn't simply possible to give a global answer to. Broadly speaking, no, we would hope that we wouldn't be impa impa impacting on local services. We wouldn't be to the working to the detriment of local services. So we would take a global view um, in terms of how do you provide the best treatments um, for the patients um, at the best place for the patients so that, the, so that both the experience, patient experience and the patient outcomes um, are optimised. And we would work with other boards in order to do that. Can I maybe give a very brief practical um, answer? So Dumfries and Galloway were having challenges recruiting ophthalmologists um, and we were looking to expand. So we've been working closely with them to see if we can make a joint appointment so that we'd work some of them time down in Dumfries and Galloway in the local area to treat patients where they could locally but where they required more intensive complex operations. That same surgeon would come up and work in the Golden Jubilee with the team at, that are in the theatres there. So we really are genuinely trying to work closely so we don't remove local services but where there are challenges we can uh, collaborate together. Can I just say in recognition of the issues that there are in Highland and in the rural boards that you uh, mentioned, we send our consultants, our orthopaedic surgeons up three times a year to Raymore Hospital. In each visit they see at least 100 outpatients um, in, for orthopaedic surgery. The patients that require surgery come to the Golden Jubilee for their, their treatment. It's all agreed and arranged in advance. The patients know that if they see our consultants in the clinic, the expectation is that they'll come to the Golden Jubilee to have their procedure carried out and that they'll have their follow-up arrangements carried out using uh, a telehealth link. 
So we've monitored that all the way along to make sure there's patient satisfaction and clinician satisfaction to that service that we provide there. We've replicated the same thing in Shetland uh, for orthopaedics also, and we have an ophthalmic surgeon that goes to Shetland three times a year. So we're really in close contact with every single board in Scotland to make sure we make it accessible for the patients to come to us and as simple as possible. So w when the surgeons go and do these uh, clinics, they have their pre-op assessment at the same time. They, we send an administrator from our hospital up there to talk to them about what their experience will be when they come to the Jubilee, where a relative can stay in the hotel, what their transport arrangements will be. So we recognise there's a gap and we try to fill it. So it is a very collaborative arrangement that we have with every single board. Thanks, Claire. Can I briefly pick up on, on something uh, that Mike Higgins said uh, in reply to Colin Smith there um, about staffing and, and your current staffing? You talked about having EU staff. How do you see Brexit impacting on recruiting and retaining the staff uh, for Golden Jubilee? I, I think we have a very small number of EU staff. Um, I, I think, like everyone else, we're waiting to see what happens um, about the EU. Um, so the very simple answer is um, that, that we don't know. Um, we don't see any major difficulties that we can't cope with at the moment that we won't be, expect we won't be expecting to cope with. But I think we're waiting to see what happens. We did um, just add, when, um, when the Brexit decision was taken, we did quite a, a detailed, depending on the information that was available, a review of that and took it as a risk paper to our board to see what risk there was, both, both in terms of we looked at all the dimensions of export, which we don't really do, but in terms of workforce and in terms of procurement, and especially because of the, the technology and the very highly complex equipment we have, so MRIs you know, are built and bought from abroad, uh, and the value of the pound could potentially have an impact on that. So with the, the information available at the time, we did our best analysis of that and took it to our board to decide whether or not it should go on our board risk register and what um, mitigating actions we could put in place in terms of recruitment in particular, but also the expansion if we need to take that forward and buy two more MRIs theatre equipment. Um, we're lucky that we have national procurement in Scotland, so it is a once for Scotland and it is the best deal you get. But again, the outcome of where Brexit takes us will be a, you know, will determine all those. And was it put on your risk register? No, it wasn't because it was determined that it was a low risk at that point. So it's, it was, it's the matrix we used to determine the risk of the, the impact and the likelihood. And at that point in time, it came out after full discussion at a board session that it was a low risk, which therefore would not go in the board register, but we still keep it and we still keep an eye on it and we still monitor it. Thanks for that. Um, like most of the, the MSPs around this table, people, um, constituents approach us when um, their experience of the NHS has perhaps not been as good as they expected or it's it's not met their expectations or, or they, they feel they've not had the service that, that, they, that they wanted. So I was quite keen to explore with you some of the data um, from your latest inpatient survey um, where it found that 98.7% of uh, patients had positive engagement score with 94% percent rating your service is excellent and um, that the board delivered more than its planned activity for inpatient day cases and diagnostic examinations with activity 12.5 percent higher than in the the previous year which obviously you're to be congratulated on that, that you're you're achieving that can so can I ask what what learning is there for other hospitals from the experience of of the golden jubilee um, and that positive engagement that you have with your your patient group Heavens, that's a, that, yeah. That, that. Well, there's so much. I mean, those of you that managed to visit would have seen the presentation of our quality framework. For the past six years, we've been working very hard to say that quality is about being an exemplar employer for our staff because they will deliver that frontline care to patients and their families and carers. It's about looking at the actual pathway of care for the patient and making sure it was the highest quality. And it's about what matters to the patient, not what's the matter with them because that's quite a different thing. If you ask someone who's um, having a hip replacement what matters to them, they might say they want to run the next 10K or they merely just want to go out and dig the garden or take their kids for a walk without being in pain. So it's about what's important for the patients. So we do, we've done a huge piece of work in training our staff and looking after them to um, raise that um, satisfaction of staff. That contributes to the satisfaction of patients, having high quality, having good communication with them. Starting that communication before they come anywhere near the Jubilee 
three. So that very first contact is a phone call once they receive their letter of appointment to explain to them what will happen and to follow that right the way through. Um, and to constantly look at the indicators, so the hard facts and the targets that are coming out from that, how many infections we have, how many complaints, um, what's our length of stay, um, cancellation rates and DNAs. So we triangulate the staff experience, the patient experience and the actual targets. And we look at that, we have a live um, digital platform and apps that are in every ward and department and are on all the board members' iPads and, and um, laptops. That You can look at that any day and any hour of the week from wherever you are in the world to see how quality is. The patients, we encourage them to give feedback in a whole range of ways so they can do it before, during and after. So, for example, in the orthopaedics, they found the experience of patients was they were so grateful, they would tell you it was wonderful as they were leaving because they just wanted to get out the door and get home. And they found that actually between seven and ten days post-op, once they were home, was when the true reflection of how exactly did that go and they talked it over with family and carers. Um, so they then get a phone call now between seven and ten days after they've gone home to ask about their wound, to ask about how their mobility and their operation has went, but more important to ask them, was there anything we could have done better um, to improve satisfaction by you? Thanks for that. You, one of the other areas that the committee has looked at is staff governance. Um, and you mentioned there, uh, what was it, you're an exemplar employer for staff. Um, how, how have you rated that and what sort of engagement have staff had, particularly through things like uh, the staff, National Staff Survey for the NHS? Yes, yes. I mean, the, we tremendous um, reply back from staff in the staff survey. I think, I'm just looking at my notes, I think it was 84% um, employee engagement satisfaction. We were one of the highest, if not the highest, in, in Scotland about the staff satisfaction rating, which is absolutely tremendous. But I think there's other indicators that we gather and show in our quality framework. Things like turnover. We have one of the lowest turnovers of staff. Now, sometimes it's good to get fresh eyes and to get new staff coming through. But over the last 10 years, we've been expanding every single year. So that gives us that freshness of new staff coming in to get those, those new ideas. Um, so we, we, we constantly offer staff the opportunity um, to tell us when things are going well. We include them right at the start. Um, and pa our partnership forum has its own values, which we table every time the, the, the partnership and the staff side and the unions meet with management. Um, and we do a 360 review at the end of those meetings to say how are behaviours, you know, how is the workplace, what more could we do to improve things. So there's a whole range of ways that we ask staff. There's also confidential contacts. There's a board member that staff can approach directly um, if they've got any concerns. And we have a whole team in the HR department. Um, we've trained... 60% of our staff, so over a 1,000 staff in the last year in what we got human factors training. And that's a very basic exercise to allow them to find a voice that if they are um, in any way um, feel as if they've been bullied or intimidated or harassed or put under pressure for workload um, in any way at all, they have the words and the training to actually raise it and do something about it. So that's, we made a commitment just over a year ago, about 18 months ago, that we were going to train every member of staff, and indeed we are all our trainers, um, and we're now up over a 1,000 members of staff, which allows them to question when things are not going well, but equally to tell us how to improve things. Can I just check <coughs> briefly, uh, Convener, when you refer to your staff, uh, do you refer to staff right across the estate? So that's your uh, hospitality staff, your nursing staff, your medical staff, your facility staff? Everyone. All, all members of staff are employed by the Golden Jubilee Foundation. But we take it a bit wider than that. So we include our volunteers when we talk about staff. And we talk about some of our uh, young people because of the Gold Award for investors and young people. So we have a, a lot of interaction with the schools. So if they're in for work experience or some of the young people volunteer work, and we include them in the staff governance. Just related to that, what about the level of use of agency and bank staff and uh, private sector, etc.? Well, private sector, none. none we're, we're trying to write, we, we are trying to repatriate all the private sector work yeah. um, for the NHS. Um, I, the bank and agency, we do have bank. Um, I don't think Julie can give you the detail of the agency. We, do, we did quite an intensive piece of work, as did all of Scotland, to reduce the use of agency. One, high, high cost. But two, you could not give the assurance of the, the clinical governance and the expertise and the skill levels of staff coming in at short notice to work. Because in, in very highly intensive areas, you tend to use agency staff in areas like your operating theatres or your MRI scanners, um, rather than just the lower grade staff that are in the ward. So I don't think we've used any agency. No, no, that's, yeah, it's really low in agency. Just pick up on that, you're saying because you couldn't verify the 
the skills, is that what you're saying there? No, because you're not aware of the level. So you would you would have an agency nurse who was a band six with intensive care training, but you couldn't plan that they would have experience, say, if you had a heart transplant patient that just came out of theatre, because that's quite co um, dedicated to what we do. And if you are um, having to employ banker agency for those very niche um, posts, are they massively expensive? Agency is, we don't use agency for that. We have our own bank and therefore they come under our training. So right. we make sure anyone in our bank who then comes into work in those areas has been trained by us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, no, I was just going to say, I think I said already, so our agency usage is very, very low across Scotland and we are very keen to keep it like that, obviously. Okay, thanks. Alison? Sort of following on um, from that question, when NHS boards can't provide a service locally, they can opt to send patients to yourselves or to the private sector. And we know that in 2015-16, uh, boards spent £81.8 million on private sector for NHS patients, obviously exceeding your income from boards, which I believe was £50.4 million. So has there been any analysis of that spend in the private sector you know, and a look at what, if there's any gaps there that you could be filling, are people going to the private sector because there's something that you couldn't pick up on? Has there been a, a look at that? Yeah, yeah. That, that? There's both. So there are certain specialties we don't do, so they couldn't be picked up by us, but they could be picked up by other hospitals and boards around the country. Um, but we, we, try to, we are trying to repatriate all of the specialty work we do from the private sector within reason. We need that expansion, I referred to Ella to do that. We've done um, predictions, projections up into 2030 of the demand of orthopaedics and ophthalmology in NHS Scotland and the rise in the elderly population and the, and the translation of that into how many operations would be required. We've also looked at the history of how much work has went to the private sector for those two specialties in particular. So we, we know how much has went to the private sector before, what we need in the future and therefore that we're using that as our planning assumptions for the, the expansion. So you would hope that that private sector spend may de decrease over time? Absolutely, that's yeah. a key purpose in the expansion. Yeah, Yeah, and you know, I read in the papers that you're funded through a combination of Scottish Government funding and payments due to referrals from other health boards, that £50.4 million. Um, there seem to be some reports of boards, a few boards, Grampian, Highland, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, no longer referring to yourselves. Um, although at the time of writing, Spice couldn't confirm the position regarding these referrals. I just wondered if you could comment on that. Is it the case that some boards or specialties aren't referring, or is that incorrect? No, that's not correct. You said Grampian, Highland and... Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Glasgow, no, they've all, they all have an allocation of capacity at the Golden Jubilee, and they have done forever. So, they, they, so they're continuing to refer to you They at the continue moment. to refer, yeah. So what we have is a three-year contract with all the boards. We have referrals from every single board in Scotland now. That's taken some time, over a number of years, actually. But we have referrals from every single board in Scotland. We have a three-year agreement with these boards. They can choose to send whatever they want within their allocation. They can choose for wherever the patient is on their waiting list or... New referrals are they? See, we we have what we refer to as seen treat referrals, um, and those would be patients that have never seen a consultant in their host their home board. They come to us, they see our consultant, they stay in our system. They we also have treat only patients who exist on a waiting list elsewhere, and they come to us just for the surgery because they've already been diagnosed and they're on a waiting list. So there's a variety of the ways that people come into our system. But every board has an allocation of capacity depending on what their particular needs are. Thank you. Thank you. Marie. Can I just ask a wee supplement to that particular question? I represent the Highlands and Islands, and, and I wondered is there, are there particular perhaps cases that aren't being referred? Because it was reported, it was certainly reported in the press earlier this year that um, a, a high profile case of a, a young woman with a cataract who had to wait a year to be seen by NHS Highland and when the press made inquiries the NHS Highland said that since last September they were no longer referring people to you guys. I know that very lady actually. Yeah. Um, they had an allocation of ophthalmology capacity at the Golden Jubilee. They had a difficult, we talked to them um, at the time about how appropriate it was for generally elderly uh, patients who travel down for what is a half hour procedure uh, to the Jubilee, but they needed the capacity and we were happy to take the patients. 
Um, we talked to them about how we might refine or test pilot um, initial consultation by telehealth link to avoid that unnecessary travel because 30% of patients don't proceed to surgery. Um, so they hadn't managed to get that happening because you need an optometrist or a specialist nurse at the Highland End to conduct the uh, the consultation and tell the consultant what they can see. He can see a certain amount. So they actually passed across their capacity to Fife who are now carrying out that pilot in the hope that we can then take it back to Highland as a, a done deal, if you like. It, it looks like we've found a way forward. So they were unable to use the capacity that we had given them. So, but they do send us orthopaedic patients and they have done now for three years. And that's the ones that we do the outreach clinic for and we do the follow up by VC, etc. So I'm hoping we can get back to helping them out with uh, ophthalmology. That lady was quite an unfortunate one. I did, I did hear about that. Obviously, had they made the phone call to say, can you take this lady, then we would have taken the lady. And um, they have severe recruitment difficulties in that yeah, particular area, so it's not like they're providing a service. Absolutely. There, and and yeah. that's why we send um, one of our ophthalmic surgeons up to do the Shetland Clinic. They used to do the Shetland Clinic from Ragmore. So we send uh, someone up there to do that. So we're trying to help as much as we can, but I hope we can get back to doing a bit more for them. Thank you. We, we, we highlight to all the boards, and not just at board level, to the clinical teams and the GPs who refer, you know, the management and the redesign of pathways and the work that June's described should never impact on an individual patient's care. And they just have to lift the phone. And if it's causing that, a patient should not hear about, you know, how we are redesigning and moving things around and how we are working with other boards. And if that is the case, just lift the phone. They've all got our phone number. It's June's number direct. And we will fix that for that pa That patient should not have been caught up in the middle of that. You know. OK. Uh, Miles. Thank you for and good morning to the panel. Um, I wanted to um, sort of press a bit more with regards to the monitoring of aftercare which patients receive, and specifically maybe when they returned to their home health board area, um, physiotherapy and things like that access. From the monitoring which you say you've been doing, um, is there specific boards where that is a problem, that people aren't having um, that pathway put in place? And certainly from some of the, the constituents I know from Lothian which have gone through, that seems to have been the case. And I wondered if that was a sort of postcode lottery when people return home to their <coughs> home health boards. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's a, a postcode lottery. So there's a, a number of things that we do. So before the patients are admitted, we actually um, prearrange their discharge. So we would not bring patients in who didn't have that already in place and it was, and it was agreed. The, we have never had a delayed discharge for over 10 years at the Golden Jubilee. And that didn't, didn't just happen by accident. That's taken a lot of hard work and planning because if we had a delayed discharge of a patient who was fit and well to go home but needed physio or occupational therapy or a stair, you know, some kind of lift or a toilet aid, then that would block the bed and therefore the next patients couldn't come in. That's a bit obvious. But we've negotiated with health boards that the next patient that would be blocked from coming in because of that would be their actual patients and therefore breaches of targets, etc. So we've worked extremely hard. We've contact with every social work department in Scotland, whereas most boards only have to have that partnership with the local social work departments and as I said we have not had a delayed discharge we haven't had a huge amount of feedback that even though it had been agreed up front that it wasn't in place when they went home that the kind of care that's received now that Mike outlined especially in our orthopaedics where patients have no general anaesthetic they control their own pain they're up walking the same day as their hip replacement they have it done in the morning, they're up walking in the afternoon home two days later. It means that the majority now don't require that additional care in the community, whereas before when they were 10 days in hospital and home with perhaps a wound drain or, or you know, some big, big kind of dressing, they would need a district nurse in, in aftercare. So the numbers of people who need that has reduced dramatically. But we, I can't say I've had a lot of feedback, and we look at all the feedback that comes in. I'm just wondering, is it one particular specialty that... Um your constituents have issue with? Is it orthopaedics or is it...? Um, this specific case, I don't have um, uh, authority to speak about that specifically, but it was a hip replacement. That was a hip, was yeah. it? So that would um, be unusual. I mean, Lothian send us over 4,000 cases a year. Yeah. Um, they're one of our highest yeah. referrers. In fact, they probably they are our highest referrer. So, you know, I'm, I'm almost pleased to hear it's only one, albeit that one is 
bad enough. But I, I'm, I'm but wondering... Not a complaint with yourselves, but with regards to what access to physiotherapy there is once you get home, it, if you need that. Yeah, it's um, generally organised in advance. It, it, yeah. Actually, most patients don't have any specific physio post-operatively when they go home. Yeah. They, they go to what we refer to as the joint school in, in, within the hospital when they come for the pre-op assessment. They leave with a video, they leave with a book, they leave with a phone number, and they're encouraged to do their exercises at home. And if sure. they have specific problems uh, beyond that, they would call us, and we would then call their GP practice to get them some additional support. But that doesn't tend to happen very often. But the one that, for me, the one area that would improve that dramatically for everyone is access to seven-day services in their local area, in the community. Yeah. And that, that is not everywhere at the moment. Um, the amount of delayed discharge across the country then is it the planned nature of the work that you do that prevents that from happening yeah because you're in a unique position that others aren't in you know when people are coming therefore way ahead of that services can be arranged so that there is no Bed yeah. uh, absolutely, but there's another part to that. The other part is that the, t the, the new innovation in technology that we've put into place to do that means that they don't require um, to go back to a nursing home or to go back to another hostel or to go back to and get care in the community. So therefore you don't need to do all those arrangements so they can go back to their own home with their own family. Give me an example of that. That technology, give me an example. So the, the enhanced recovery that's now been rolled out around Scotland, where there, there's no general anaesthetic, you do not have a urinary catheter inserted, so therefore you don't need to be discharged home with that in place and re therefore require a, a district nurse. Um, you're up walking in three days, so you don't get chest infections, and we have, we have all that evidence behind it, so you don't need antibiotics, so you don't need to visit your GP. So there's a whole complexity of discharge arrangements had to be done five, ten years ago that are no longer required now. And... Um, so is there, is there stuff that you're doing in, in that regard that others can learn from? Or are they already doing it? And if they are, why are we not seeing the eradication of daily discharge? It's being rolled out. I would think all health boards are now doing enhanced recovery in orthopaedics. We have now spread that into our cardiac surgery and our thoracic surgery um, because it's a principle of care. It's not just purely for one specialty. Um, so we are now spreading that out. And we share it in our team actually around the country um, and trained people in how to, in how to do the enhanced recovery. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for uh, your attendance this morning and we'll just suspend briefly.
The third item on the agenda today is subordinate legislation. We have uh, one affirmative instrument as usual. With affirmative instruments, we will uh, have an evidence taking session with the Minister and his officials on the instrument. Um, uh, once we have uh, all our questions answered, we'll have a formal debate on the motion. Uh, the instrument we're looking at today is the registration of social workers and social service workers in care services, Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft. Can I welcome to the meeting Mark MacDonald, Minister uh, for <laughs> Child Care and Early Years, uh, Diana White, Senior Policy Officer uh, at, the, at the Office of the Chief Social Work Advisor, and Ruth uh, Looney, uh, Principal Legal Officer. Um, all Scottish Government. Um, can I have a brief statement from the Minister? Uh, certainly, Convener. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce these regulations uh, made under Sections 78.2 and 104.1 of the Public Services Reform Scotland Act 2010. Uh, these regulations amend Regulation 5 and the Schedule to the Registration of Social Workers and Social Service Workers in Care Services Scotland Regulations 2013, uh, the principal regulations. Uh, regulation 5 of the principal regulations, uh, read with the schedule, uh, requires social services workers within the scope of registration to register with the Scottish Social Services Council, SSSC, uh, specifically that all new workers commencing employment for the first time in any of the groups within the scope of registration must achieve registration within six months of commencing that employment, and where persons are already working as social service workers, the dates specified in the schedule are the dates by when these workers workers must achieve registration. The Registration of Social Workers and Social Service Workers in Care Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 uh, before you uh, relate to the latest groups of workers for whom registration with the SSSC will commence in October 2017. Uh, these are support workers working in care at home and housing support services. Uh, these are the last groups of social service workers within the current scope of registration uh, who will require to register with the SSSC. Uh, the 2017 regulations amend the schedule to the principal regulations to specify the two additional descriptions of social service worker requiring to register with the SSSC, uh, support worker in a care at home service and support worker in a housing support service, uh, and set the date by which existing workers working in these services must achieve registration with the SSSC uh, as 30th September 2020. So in summary, the regulations maintain and fulfil the policy intention, which has commanded support from all parties, that registration with the Scottish Social Services Council is a prerequisite of employment and continuing employment as a social service worker uh, and provides the final dates for the achievement of registration for these final groups of workers. I uh, move the regulations. Thank you. Could I ask, um, in relation to the fee that's um, been asked to pay, the £25 fee, has that been, um, is there any sort of evidence of who is paying that? Is it all falling on individual um, staff, because we know that staff in this field are some of the lowest paid and um, have some of the most precarious employment practices um, of, of uh, a lot of um, our public sector workers. Um, are they are they having to pick up that fee themselves, or is their employer paying it for them? Uh, so the um, individual workers usually pay their annual registration fee, and it's an annual registration fee um, to the Triple SC. Um, and as you identify, the fee for these groups will be twenty-five pounds, which I believe, beyond uh, outside of social work students, is the lowest fee uh, charged by the Triple SC for registration. Uh, it's also worth noting that individuals uh, can claim tax relief against their registration fees, and that would reduce the cost from twenty-five pounds lower to around about twenty pounds. Okay, um, and there's, uh, are there any employers that you've got evidence of who are actually picking that up? I'm not uh, aware, uh, convener, of whether there are employers who are paying that fee. Um, I don't have the kind of comprehensive information in front of me that would make me uh, have awareness of that, but uh, obviously uh, there may be some employers who choose to do so, but I'm not uh, personally aware of any who are doing so. Okay, anybody get any questions? Alison? Further on that, convener, I realise this is a requirement of the, the triple SC, but um, uh, the government's consultation on this issue, um, has there been any and what feedback did you receive? Because this is an area that we're desperately trying to recruit more people into and, you know, while I realise for some people it may not be a lot, for others it may be a barrier. Um, you know, has, has there been any discussion of a waiver for those who find this a barrier that they can't overcome? 
So, well, the triple, it was the triple SC who consulted. It wasn't the government's uh, role to consult. It was the triple SC's role to consult. Uh, and um, they consulted with the sector um, with over 90,000 individuals uh, contacted as part of that. Um, and they received uh, 3,813 responses, so a 4.2% response to the consultation. Now, undoubtedly, um, there will have been individuals who will not have been happy at the fact that the fees were uh, going up across the piece. Um, however, um, if you look at the uh, general trend in terms of the, in the monetary increases, the monetary increases for most of uh, the lower paid end uh, of the uh, the, the spectrum uh, was uh, very small in terms of the uplift, um, but I have also asked SSSC to look in future at the possibility of introducing uh, an income-related uh, system uh, when it comes to registration fees, and that's something they're taking away to look at. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, I think that's the fees probably for an average care worker about equivalent to three hours pay, roughly. I would say, which is quite significant. Um, any other questions? No? Thank you. Can we move on to agenda item four, which is a formal debate on the affirmative SSI in which we've just taken evidence. Um, I have to remind committee members uh, that they should not put questions to the minister during the formal debate and officials may not speak in the debate. Can I invite the minister to move uh, motion S5M052008? Uh, moved, convener. Uh, the motion is that uh, the Health and Sport Committee recommends that the registration of social workers and social service workers in Care Services Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017 draft be approved. Uh, can I invite members to contribute to any discussion? No? Thank you. Um, would you like to sum up, Minister? Don't believe I require to, convener. The <laughs> um, question is that motion S5M052008 be approved. Are we all agreed? agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Suspend briefly. Uh, agenda item five is subordinate legislation. Um, uh, th this item uh, is a negative instrument, and the instrument is regulation of uh, care, social service workers, Scotland Amendment Order 2017 SSI 2017-95. There has been no motion to annul, and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has not made any comment on the instrument. Can I invite any comments from members? No. Has uh, the com committee agreed to make no recommendations? That is agreed, thank you. And as previously agreed, we will now move into private session.